Hello, I'm Joe Clark, and I'm pleased to be digging deep. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books and Abacus Data. This is the latest in our series of one-on-one conversations with thoughtful, insightful, analytical, interesting, accomplished people in so many different fields. We talk to Olympic champions, musicians, entrepreneurs, television hosts, and more. We explore their stories, their challenges, their defining moments, and we learn from them the powerful lessons we can apply to our own lives. And we do this in a couple of ways. We start off with rapid-fire questions to learn a little bit more about the guests, maybe some things you didn't know about them before. And then we start digging deep into those stories and life lessons. I'm very excited about our guest today, Joe Clark. Joe Clark was the 16th Prime Minister of Canada. He took office in 1979 on the day before his 40th birthday, becoming the youngest Prime Minister in Canadian history. He later served in Cabinet as the Secretary of State for External Affairs. That's the role that would be later known as Foreign Affairs Minister. And he's widely regarded as one of the best foreign ministers in Canadian history, playing a key role in several important international events and issues like the end of apartheid in South Africa. Joe Clark also served as the Minister of Constitutional Affairs, leading the country through difficult negotiations that led to the historic Charlottetown Accord which was unanimously approved by all Canadian federal, provincial, and territorial governments, plus representatives of Indigenous groups. But ultimately, it was rejected in a national referendum. When he retired from politics, Joe Clark was widely regarded as one of the most respected parliamentarians of his time. Now, I don't have time to share all the details of Joe Clark's long and remarkable career, Since leaving politics, he's written a couple of books. He shared his wisdom and experience through several learning institutions in Canada and the U.S., and he has served as an advisor to governments around the world. In our very wide-ranging conversation, we talk a lot about leadership and decision-making, about some of the key moments in his life. We talk about his heroes, from Jackie Robinson to Nelson Mandela, and what he learned when he met Mandela just after he was released from prison. We discuss some of his key decisions, including why he chose to serve in cabinet after losing the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party. We talk about how he was able to avoid the bitterness and divisiveness normally associated with politics, why he tried so hard to listen to the other side. We talk about the remarkable women in his life, including his mother, his wife, Maureen McTeer, and his daughter, Catherine. We talk about the current state of politics and why he has deep concerns about the future. And also, we hear some great stories, including how he was almost kicked out of university and why. And the very bizarre career prediction that an aptitude test produced for him early in life. This is a very memorable discussion. I think you will enjoy it. One last thing before we get started, if you like what you hear, please subscribe to the podcast, post a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, and also share this podcast with your network. And if you're looking for more information about this episode of the show, including links to anything we talk about in our discussion, if you want to read my daily blog where I post every single day of the year, or subscribe to my newsletter, The Weekly Dig, it's an e-newsletter with five very quick items I've learned about each week. You can do all of that at our website, letsdigdeep.com. Again, letsdigdeep.com. You can also find there a link to my TEDx talk. Now, let's start digging deep with Joe Clark. Joe Clark, it is a tremendous honor to welcome you to the podcast. I'm so grateful for your time. I want to thank you for your long career of service to our country and to the world. And I'm also going to say, uh, I want to thank you uh, because no matter what you did in your professional life, you're obviously a great dad and your wife, Maureen McTeer is obviously a wonderful mother because your daughter, Catherine is one of the (laughs) nicest, kindest, most considerate people that I've ever met in my life. So congratulations on that. Thank you very much. 
So let's uh, start with some quick questions and answers to uh, maybe uh, uncover some things about you. You're a very well-known figure, obviously, but maybe there'll be some things that uh, will show up here that people didn't know before. Um, what is your fondest childhood memory? I grew up in the prairies, uh, right beside the mountains. Um, and uh, it was a very comfortable, not particularly exceptional uh, childhood, I think. Uh, the war broke out uh, the year I was born, and uh, that meant that uh, disproportionately it was a town where uh, women ran the stores because their, uh, uh, their husbands were, uh, were abroad. Um, we were safe from all of that, uh, but we also had an international presence there. There was an emergency flying training school at, at High River, and among the advantages of that was that they uh, used to show movies. And I remember seeing The Wizard of Oz when I was two or three, but I had a very comfortable, fairly unexceptional uh, childhood growing up in, uh, uh, in Alberta. Who was your hero when you were 10 years old? <laughs> when I was 10 years old, my hero was Jackie Robinson of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, that was the year he won the Most Valuable Player Award. Um, and I'm sure that part of it was race. Here was this guy, uh, who had life's odds stacked against him, and he uh, kept on and uh, and performed so extraordinarily. When I came to know more about him, uh, I realized how tough that was and how he faced his challenges uh, and the help he had. And of course, there's a Canadian dimension to that, because in his earliest days, uh, he suffered the most terrible insults in most of the stadia he played. And then he went to Montreal, and uh, he and his wife were, uh, were welcomed uh, absolutely uh, by uh, the, the people of Montreal, even the people who weren't baseball fans, but they were neighbors, they were people, they were taken in. And I take that as a sort of a, a Canadian attribute and tribute. Yeah, I knew you were a baseball fan, so that's a, a, it's an interesting choice to hear that from you. What did you think you were going to be when you grew up? I hadn't really thought very much about it. Uh, mine was a, a fairly comfortable childhood. We weren't wealthy at all. We ran a newspaper, my mom, uh, my mom taught. By accident, well, not really by accident, I, was, I entered into a um, public speaking contest when I was about 16, I guess, and I won. Uh, and it had to do with uh, the development of media in, um, in Western Canada. But it meant that I could, um, come to Ottawa as a rotary adventurer in citizenship. And it was a quite extraordinary trip to me. I had really never been anywhere before. Uh, and we got on the train, uh, kept loading new kids on at every stop uh, and came across the country. We didn't sleep as I recall, uh, but here we arrived in Ottawa and I was, uh, uh, and what was happening at that time, interestingly, was the great pipeline debate, which was one of the momentous uh, uh, parliamentary debates in Canadian history. Uh, and uh, I wanted to go in to the uh, House of Commons to watch the debate. And I sort of played hooky from the program and went down and I couldn't get in. The lineups were huge. But then on a Friday afternoon, somebody in the program said, we know you've been sneaking away to Parliament. It seems there are spaces in the gallery now if you want to go. So down I went. And of course, it was private members hour. And the discussion was about uh, a couple of miles of railway line between Princess and Patricia in my home province of, of Alberta. But I nonetheless then became very interested in the political process. And while I had no firm intent to, uh, to become active myself at that time, I'd say it developed. And I was very active through my university years and later in, um, uh, in, the, in, in national and provincial politics. Yeah. And some 20 years later, you were in the House of Commons and, and eventually the prime minister. Uh, yeah. Amazing. But it, it, there's, there's a sort of a myth around that uh, as soon as I stopped teething, I declared I was going to be prime minister. That just wasn't true. Uh, I, uh, I was like a lot of fortunate kids growing up. I was reading books and looking around and um, uh, hadn't really made many plans as to what I might do. When, uh, uh, when I got out of high school. What would you say is your life story in six words? I can't say that. I don't. Well, I mean, I could, I was, I was born lucky. 
uh, I took opportunities. Uh, I think that I tried to be interested in other people. I think that's partly because my dad was a local journalist and a weekly newspaper editor. And uh, part of what he had to do was learn about other people. He wasn't intrusive, but he was just interested. And uh, I think that uh, I've, I've always tried to do that as objectively as I can. That's not six words. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and, and by the way, I feel a real connection to your dad because as I've been reading and about you and, and um, seeing other interviews that you've done, uh, I, I heard you talk about your dad as a weekly newspaper editor and I started the community newspaper in my neighborhood here in Ottawa. So oh, great. Um, yeah, so I have a, a special place in my heart for, for community newspaper editors. Um, what, for what do you feel most grateful? Oh, um, it's become accentuated as time goes on. I'm grateful, immensely grateful for being raised with all the good fortune uh, within my reach. And that's become dramatically clear when I've traveled internationally and I've seen the conditions in which uh, uh, other kids raised. I was, were raised, I was born very lucky. I was, if I may say so, well raised. It wasn't my fault, it was my parents' fault. Uh, and was in a, a, a good and a peaceful town. But uh, really, I was Im immensely lucky to be born here with the opportunities that Canada provided. What's been the best year of your life so far and why? <laughs> the best year had to be 1976. Uh, Catherine was born. Um, I, I won the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party. Uh, those, were, uh, those were great years. Uh, it was uh, an upset victory, as you'll recall. Uh, but uh, that was a great year for me. And what's been the toughest year of your life so far? The toughest year was when I lost the leadership in uh, 1983. And uh, it, um, I provoked the convention. Uh, we, my party was the minority party in the country. It had to have as much support as it could. It was racked as parties often are by internal uh, conflict. Uh, I needed to be uh, clear that I had um, a... Uh, I had the party behind me, or we would not be able to uh, uh, to form a government. And so I decided I would, uh, con would call a convention, cause a convention to be called, and I ran, and uh, I didn't win. And that was that was tough. I was surprised at how tough it was. In fact, we went away for um, uh, three or four weeks and uh, came back. <laughs> and I remember waking up one morning and saying, uh, "I can't breathe." And I phoned my doctor and I said, uh, Bruce, I can't breathe. And he said, if you couldn't breathe, you wouldn't be talking to me. Uh, and he said, you have trauma. And I thought, I don't have trauma. But in fact, I did. And it didn't really vest until um, I'd been on holiday, came back, and um, uh, I got back to whatever normal was. Yeah, and... and We'll come back to that because you recovered from that and you made some very interesting decisions about how you were going to spend your time going forward from there. Uh, very different decisions from what many other people in your circumstances would have done. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes. Sure. What one person would you say has had the greatest impact on your life? Well, d depends on the category. The, indivi the international individual whom I was most impressed by, most admired was Nelson Mandela. I had met him... Uh, literally days after he had come out of prison, I had chaired the Commonwealth Committee that was fighting for his freedom and was invited. Uh, I was one of two white people in the room. I was invited to the meeting in Lusaka, Zambia when he came out of prison. And I remember that the meeting started, there were only about 80, 90 people there, most of them grizzled veterans of the, uh, uh, the African National Congress. And one of them uh, spoke very harshly of the, uh, the Afrikaans who had imprisoned them. And Telson Vandela said, we have to remember how difficult all this is to them. And I thought, what extraordinary generosity, which characterized his career and was really the, the model that he, uh, the aspirational model he set for uh, leaders in the world. And then, of course, I've been extremely lucky in the two women in my life, in Maureen uh, and in Catherine. Uh, Maureen is a lot... Um, tougher and more accomplished than sometimes uh, people give her credit for. And she uh, uh, not only fought my battle, she established her own uh, very substantial credentials. So I've been lucky in that too. 
What's the most important lesson that you've learned that you would want to share with other people? Hmm. I was going to say you shouldn't take yourself serious too seriously. In fact, you have to take yourself seriously, but you have to take your take others with equal seriousness. And I've tried to do that. Uh, I've tried to understand uh, where they were coming from, why they were doing what they were doing. I've tried to do that both uh, domestically, personally, I guess, and certainly when I had the privilege of being a foreign minister, I, I tried to understand uh, others. And I think that's, uh, that's critical. Do you have a secret talent? Is there anything that you're good at that, that people may not know about? They may know about it. I think I listen. Uh, more than uh, than others do, and um, uh, <laughs> as time goes by, I notice that is not a universal talent, and I think it's been uh, been very helpful for me. I don't always understand everything I hear, and I don't always act on it, but uh, I try to understand where others are coming from and listen to their preoccupations. Mm. That is in it seems anyway to be in uh, increasingly short supply, unfortunately, certainly in in public discourse. What uh, what is your boldest prediction for the future? We're in trouble, I think. I'm not sure that's a bold prediction, but uh, I think that uh, one positive consequence of this COVID scare is that it's made us realize how frail so many of the things we'd uh, counted on turn out to be. That's the case domestically, it's the case uh, internationally. And uh, the risk is that we become very comfortable. Uh, the fact that so many Canadians uh, and others are disregarding, for example, the, uh, the strictures about um, social distancing uh, is an indication that we take so much for granted and we simply assume that a lot of systems work. I think if I learned one thing looking back in my career in public life, it is that a lot of the systems we think work don't work. And uh, one of the real challenges for sensible public, uh, publics, for, for people who think about how we improve things, is to identify the things that don't work. Some jump up and hit you. I mean, the, uh, the terrible, terrible failure of our care for senior citizens, uh, locking them into places full of contagion, uh, which we did across the board, that simply was a huge mistake. Uh, but there are all sorts of others, and I've encountered them uh, through my life. And I don't think we are good enough in examining our own limitations. We get too locked into uh, assumptions that uh, that we think uh, think work, and and more and more often, they don't. Hmm. That's a great point. Um, if you were giving a speech to students today, a graduating class of students, what would be your message in that kind of commencement address? I think it would be to aspire. Uh, to uh, do more than you think you can do. I, I was going to say to accept no limits. That's not really what I would, but I think to aspire. What book are you most likely to recommend to other people? Is there a book that's had a big impact on you? <laughs> oh, there's been a, there was a, a book, a prairie book by Wallace Stegner called Wolf Willow um, that uh, I recommend to, uh, to everyone. Uh, it, uh, uh, he talked about being raised in a very remote area of the world, but that he was on the building end. And uh, I think the idea of considering yourself to be on the building end is, uh, is critically important. Um, there are a lot of books being written now about our current situations that, uh, that are, are, some are alarmist, but some are, are very interesting. And um, some of them, as they analyze what has, uh, what has caused some of the circumstances uh, that we're, we're dealing with uh, are, uh, uh, are very informative. So uh, going back to the point about um, our, our, our living in a time that has to change, we have quite a bit of help by uh, serious commentators in identifying uh, what some of the problems were. Commentators, maybe journalists, authors uh, is, a, is a better phrase. Yeah. Any, any in particular that come to mind that you think have really had a lot to share recently? Black Wave. It's written by Kim Gallus, who's a uh, Lebanese uh, writer, uh, and she is tracing the uh, growing tensions between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran and how they have transformed the Middle East uh, and consequently the world. And she is a, a great writer, but also uh, it's a compelling uh, story about things I should have known about before and uh, didn't. And uh, 
I am becoming informed. Mm. Black Wave by Kim Gattas. Black Wave by Kim Gattas, G-H-A-T-T-A-S. Okay. Well, thank you for answering those questions. We're going to take a short break. And in just a moment, we will begin digging deep with Joe Clark. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go-to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric. I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them too. First of all, they bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, but that doesn't mean they're offshore, and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. ZenBooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high-level advice, and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with ZenBooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions, but in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper, or you have some accounting staff on your team, I think you should still talk to ZenBooks and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks. Digging Deep is all about helping you make better decisions, and so is Abacus Data. Most leaders struggle to connect with and engage their audiences. Why is that? It's because they aren't sure how they think and feel and how they will react. Abacus Data can give you the strategic insights you need to make better decisions and to make them confidently. Here's a good example. A major national union was recently negotiating a new agreement for its thousands of members. This had the potential to be a very difficult process. There were many competing interests. So they brought in Abacus Data to conduct thorough and detailed research of their members to learn exactly where they stood, what they were thinking, what they wanted. And as a result, they were able to secure a strong new deal that was accepted overwhelmingly in a national vote. Abacus Data helps all of its clients understand what's really happening in the minds of their employees, clients, and stakeholders. They help them avoid costly blind spots. And they're really good at what they do. In fact, Abacus Data was one of the most accurate pollsters in the 2019 Canadian federal election. Make the one decision that will improve all of your other decisions. Let Abacus Data help you move forward with confidence and clarity. Go to abacusdata.ca. That's abacusdata.ca. Joe Clark, once again, thank you so much for being a guest on Digging Deep. I'm really looking forward to the next part of our conversation. And I, um, I heard a story that you took an aptitude test or something like that in university and that it produced a very interesting result. Is that true? It was a very early days of sort of of testing. And interestingly, uh, the late Jim Coots, uh, very prominent in the Liberal Party, and I were born in the same hospital. Uh, He was from the neighboring town of Nanton, and we were naturally competitors. Uh, But we arrived at the University of Alberta at the same time, and we were both required to take these, uh, whatever they called those tests, to determine what career might be most appropriate for us. A whole bunch of students at the time had to take it, but Jim Coots and I were the only two whose result was the same. And it was predicted that we were both ideally suited to be undertakers. <laughs> which, uh, 
was a, a forecast we both moved away from as quickly yes. as we could. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says, uh, but it's- I have no idea. Story. I think the yeah. testing has improved since that time. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. Um, and is it true that you uh, you nearly got expelled from university over uh, something that happened when you were the editor of the university newspaper at the University of Auburn? I was the editor of the, of the Gateway, and we ran annually a gag edition. And uh, uh, we had a particularly uh, emphatic gag edition, of which I'm, I'm still quite proud. And there was, uh, in fact, I was fined. I have I had a, an annual honorarium as editor of $500. They took half of that. But there was talk of my being expelled. And I went to the dean of the law school. And uh, he, uh, in fact, he came to me. He defended, defended me. And I went to him after that defense and thanked him for his defense of freedom of the press. And he looked at me and he said, young man, freedom of the press has nothing to do with this. I went to this university with your mother and she deserved better than this. So, <laughs> True story, but interesting about generational influences and uh, attitudes at that time. Yeah. And the gag <laughs> issue was, it was kind of a, a like a satirical sort of issue. Is that what provoked yeah, the reaction? We, um, among other things, we claimed that uh, then Premier Ernest Manning was in fact uh, the evangelist Amy Semple McPherson who had disappeared from the United States into the Pacific Ocean and never been heard of since. And we claimed that she had in fact uh, come back, transformed, become adopted by William Eberhardt. And I think one of the offensive lines was that uh, after Eberhardt took Manning in, he took in the rest of the province and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, it, was, it was juvenile humor, funny at the time. Uh, uh, I think it was in the tradition of the University of Alberta Gateway gag. Yeah. Um, so you touched on this earlier, and I, I wanted to talk about the role of uh, of strong women in your life, because your mother was a teacher, and you talked about growing up in the time of the Second World War when uh, women took leadership roles out of necessity. Um, your wife, Maureen McTeer, has, has um, had a prominent role in our country and was as a pioneer in many ways. And um, and caused a great debate over things that seem so antiquated now, uh, uh, like keeping her own name and that sort of thing. Um, and you you have a, a very strong daughter as well. So can you talk a little more about the role of these women in your life and what you've learned from them? It, it never really seemed extraordinary to me. Um, uh, my mother was a strong influence on me, but uh, not overly active in the uh, town, I thought, although I've had people whom she taught uh, tell me years later that she quite literally changed their lives. Uh, and um, uh, I sort of took that for granted. It wasn't that she was uh, a woman, it was that she was my mother. And um, uh, I, uh, I thought of her in those fairly, uh, uh, fairly limited terms. And I think we were all blind to uh, a lot of the questions of, of equality. I mean, I, I think back to uh, uh, the House, to the 1979 election. Um, uh, the Progressive Conservatives elected only two women to the House of Commons at that time. Uh, and the other parties were not much better. Uh, so the idea that uh, women would be treated as equally as equals in the political arena uh, it had happened occasionally, but those kind those people were regarded as really quite uh, unusual. And uh, our blinkers came off uh, with time. I mean, and it wasn't. Um, it was because we realized that uh, uh, there was an enormous uh, ability and perspective that uh, had been denied before. So I didn't try to make a cause of this. Uh, I. Uh, uh, and it never really occurred to me to uh, be, be concerned that uh, uh, Maureen kept her name. I understand pride in, in family, pride in name, pride in identity. And um, uh, I think we were all surprised a little bit by uh, the furor it caused, except it indicated, again, a mode of thinking that had grown out of date before we'd recognized uh, that was happening. That didn't make it any easier to break, on the contrary. And it still isn't broken, uh, but um, uh, so I think that was an awakening to reality 
that uh, came to me in stages and uh, where I've been able to, I've tried to advance it. And, and obviously you were, you mentioned Nelson Mandela and I want to come back to this story of when you met him, which is a remarkable story, obviously, but um, it strikes me that you have, uh, like others, you've always thought in terms of opportunity and capacity and building and growth and that there is, if we don't create a world in which everyone can participate, in which everyone can lead and contribute, we, we all lose, don't we? We do, but there's an inter there are interesting ironies in all of these lessons. I remember I was on an election observation mission in Cameroon once, driving between very distant polling places and listening to the radio. And on came Nelson Mandela being interviewed by someone I'd never heard of. And he said he attributed a large part of his success to what he called the chiefly tradition. He had born, been born into a chief's family and without, and I don't know how the process happened, but he came to recognize that, that there was a responsibility of, of leadership. And that's a fairly rare slice of, uh, of humanity that would have that, that kind of upbringing. And of course, an extraordinary individual and in that he would take it to heart and, and, uh, and live it so, so fully. But um, it was also um, uh, elitist. Uh, chiefs are not like the rest of us, and he was raised in a tradition to lead. One of the real factors about a, an increasingly democratic society, democratic in a small d sense, is that um, more and more of us have the opportunity to express our capacities. Uh, we don't necessarily have a tradition, a chiefly tradition to guide us, uh, but um, uh, also, the world is much more open to people who were never chiefs. Uh, and, um, uh, but the formation, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that uh, somewhere in a lot of people who become, uh, uh, who become influential in the world, in, in cases they're driven by, by great disappointment or bitterness or something of that kind. But in other uh, ways, they are driven by a sense of some kind of obligation to the whole. And what's interesting, among the things that's interesting about uh, Mandela was how widely and well he respected others, including his competitors. I work now in a, in a voluntary organization with F.W. de Klerk, who was the president of South Africa at the time, that, um, that at the time of the change. And uh, the relations, obviously, between Mandela and de Klerk were, were, different for, uh, were difficult for a number of reasons, but they both made it work. Uh, they both understood that, uh, that they had to exercise uh, their influence and their, their leadership. And I think that more and more, as the capacities of more people grow, so does the necessity not to get locked up in your own capacities and preoccupations, but to find ways in which you can, uh, can work with others. Uh, we're not going to have many messiahs uh, from now on. We're not going to have many more Mandelas, probably no more Mandelas. So more of it is going to be up to more of us. And we're going to have to find ways in which we work with people with whom we might uh, otherwise disagree and uh, try to identify uh, common purposes, recognize that we're going to have to take as well as give. And I think that is uh, take and give and change. Uh, the question of uh, changing systems that, uh, that aren't working is, uh, is becoming uh, more imperative now and in a sense more difficult because uh, apartheid was at least a tangible system you could bring down. Uh, many of the changes we have to make uh, have to do with changing our own thinking first and uh, recognizing that uh, uh, the things we had, that we had taken for granted aren't working well and need to be uh, modernized, brought up to date. So I wanted to add, that leads actually to a, to a question about kind of how things work today and, and how much polarization there has become. And of course, we, we look at that in the context naturally right now of American politics because of everything that's happened in recent in the last in the last four or five years. But but it's not just in American politics that this is happening. So um, do you see the potential uh, for us to return to a, a different style of politics where we are 
there is consensus building, where there is uh, collaboration, listening, as opposed to what we seem to be seeing more and more of right now, the trend seems to be in the opposite direction. Well, there's certainly a greater need for it. Uh, whether it's going to develop is, is interesting. I'm, I'm encouraged by the attitude that President Biden brings to his office, but uh, I'm also very deeply disturbed by uh, how much one can almost call the worst elements of um, the U.S. have been brought out in the last four or five years. And by worst, I don't mean right wing or Republican or anything of that kind, but the insistence on, uh, on having one's way against others, the, the breaking down of coming together. But let me pick up on something here. Uh, there is a difference between the two great North American democracies, and it goes back to our beginnings. Uh, the Americans were created as a country because they rejected Europe. Uh, Canada was created as a country because we wanted to transplant in a new terrain the values of Europe. Uh, and we did that. Uh, and we did that deliberately, and it wasn't easy. We were a huge country. We had a fundamental difference between um, among, if you will now, uh, uh, indigenous Canadians and Canadians of English origin and those of French origin. We failed largely on the indigenous side, maybe making progress, but we didn't on the French English side. We created a country that was various. Uh, our history of in-migration has been different from the United States because um, uh, the United States has uh, uh, encouraged people who came from a way to subsume themselves in the American identity that was emphatic and strong and quite constructive in the world. We have been more prepared to let people be who they are on the sort of unspoken condition that they work with others who are different. And that has been a Canadian characteristic for a long time, driven by necessity for some time. We're a huge country. Uh, we're, we're federal by nature. We have to agree. Uh, but, but also we have had some quite remarkable instances where we have agreed. Now, um, I'm not sure, I, my, I am quite worried that uh, those capacities are declining. And I look at that in the field where I have most experience. Uh, I look at that, for example, in the context of political parties. Uh, there was a time, going back again to the time when I became leader, and when the three national parties, the then NDP, the then Liberals, the Progressive Conservatives, were all inclusive parties. They would draw anybody in. Uh, my predecessor as the leader of the PC party, Robert Stanfield, warned as he was leaving about the rise of interest groups. And what's happened is that people have become much more loyal to their particular interest than they have been to the idea of conciliating with and working with, uh, with others. The political parties now, none of the political parties now uh, represents the whole in the way they did in the 1960s. Uh, the Liberal Party talks about a coalition of progressives, uh, whatever they are, but they are not very welcoming to people who don't share their views. The Conservative Party might be getting better, we'll see, I certainly hope so, uh, but it, was, uh, it, it has been very rigid, very uninclusive in, uh, in the people it draws in. And the NDP uh, has moved away from the, the sort of uh, the Ed Broadbent tradition, if you will, that was a, that's very dangerous for the country because um, uh, I wrote some time ago that I learned more about my country within a political party than I ever did from, uh, uh, from books, because suddenly here were all these very different people from different parts of the country, but we were in the same party. We were uh, brothers, sisters, in a sense, and we learned from one another rather than fighting with one another. We did that because we were together, and that Canadian tradition has... Um, has virtually disappeared from our, our parties. And it's, it's a very dangerous uh, uh, situation because if you are close to someone and there's a real crisis and you are close, you can sit down and say, look, let's take a look at what we can do about this. That's harder when you um, live in different, uh, different principalities. And unfortunately, I think that it's having an impact upon our um, uh, two things. One, it's having an, an impact upon our, our capacity to make federalism work. Uh, that requires cooperation. And uh, we are uh, one of the untold stories or uncelebrated stories now of Canadian federalism was back when uh, the issues in Quebec were coming to a boil. And the, 
the then premier, prime minister, he called himself, of Ontario, John Robarts, uh, convened a national conference. I think it came up one day when he and uh, Daniel Johnson, the then premier of Quebec, both guys in their sense were having a guys conversation. And they sort of said, why, what could be done about this? And they decided to hold this conference. Uh, they were there ahead of Lester Pearson. Uh, they were, they uh, were conciliators in their own way, but they did it and they brought others along. And uh, that Confederation for Tomorrow conference uh, back in the day was a, a signal event that encouraged the better instincts, the, the excellent instincts of Lester Pearson uh, nationally and um, had been a, a highlight in reconciliation in the, um, in the country. I'm afraid that instinct uh, of seeing the whole rather than the particular is declining in the country. And these are among the things that we have to uh, re-examine as we uh, wake up jolted from uh, a health crisis uh, again, I've looked at some stats the other day. I'm on the board of, of GlobeScan uh, that does a lot of international polling and advice, but has also recently done some, um, uh, some work on, um, uh, on professions that are respected. In terms of trust, uh, and this is a, a poll, an international average of 17 very different countries. Trust in the medical profession is 81%. Trust in national government is 15%. Trust in global companies is 12%. Trust in the media is minus 2%. Uh, those are quite alarming statistics. Uh, it's one, it was a poll taken in uh, largely in August. Uh, so things have probably got uh, more serious since that time. Uh, but that's a very diff difficult diagnosis for a a country and a society that has to find ways in which we could build trust and come together. And it underlines the point I've been trying to make that uh, we're facing uh, problems that in their way are as much a threat to our society as COVID is, uh, because we at least think we have some vaccines uh, for COVID, which we believe over time will be successful. Uh, you asked as we began this conversation whether developments in the world are positive or negative. But right now, they're fairly negative. Uh, things are coming apart. Uh, Brexit has just occurred. Uh, nationalist movements are growing in all sorts of uh, other European uh, countries. Uh, uh, distemper is, is rising. And, and it's, uh, it's not simply wild, untamed ambition of, of, of ne'er-do-wells. On the contrary, it reflects a lack of trust, a lack of common purpose. And once again, to get back to the Canada question, what do we do about that? We've got to be very careful not to preach. We are at our worst when we preach. Uh, but we also have uh, credentials earned at home and expressed abroad of respecting other people and bringing them together. And that's going to be increasingly important uh, in, uh, in time to come. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I, th I think we've got to, when we come out of the, as we come out of COVID, we're going to have to take a look at all of the problems that have become exposed to us and how we, we have to deal with them and what our instruments are. And we have to, we can't be nostalgic about uh, the instruments that might work. We have to be quite hard headed, but we also have to look, recognize the fact that we Canadians have an advantage that many other countries don't, not in our physical material wealth, but in our capacity to both reflect and communicate uh, respect and understanding. Sorry for the rant. No, that's uh, this is all very interesting. And I, and I know you wrote about uh, the role that Canada can play in the world in one of the books that you wrote. And and the term that you've used to describe that is to to lead from beside. Um, and I I really like that term, not just in a in a sort of global politics context, but even in a in a personal leadership context. I think there is more room for individuals to lead from beside rather than from in front of others. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. And uh, again, the polling data I referred to indicated a, a growing uh, interest in non-governmental work. And I don't mean simply the big charities, but people doing things locally. It's more challenging now. Uh, uh, Catherine and Chad, uh, have, are much more busy as parents. Uh, parenthood is much more pervasive than it was uh, when I was being raised. Uh, and um, 
Uh, so and the other, other pressures are there, but there's no question that the power of individuals uh, working together uh, is, is increasing. One has to determine how we do it. I mean, where is there a useful avenue? Because no one wants to, uh, to waste their time. Uh, but I think it is a developing ethic. And it's easier to do in a neighborhood than it is the country. Uh, but um, uh, neighborhoods are great places to learn. And uh, that kind of capacity can be, uh, can be applied. We have to recognize that our status quo isn't working. And we have to recognize that there's like, not likely to be any universal change that will suddenly magically transform that. We're going to have to work at it. And the point you're making is that in many ways, we are already doing that. We're doing that locally, personally. So the challenge is, uh, how do we maximize that? How do we make that apply uh, to uh, the larger challenges that we face? Are there other leadership lessons that you would share based on your experience as a leader and observing other leaders uh, in the world? I think there is a great temptation now. Uh, there is a Twitter temptation. Uh, we uh, we want to be we want to be seen for or we feel driven to to uh, record our particular view uh, as quickly as broadly as we as we can. Uh, very often, in order to bring others aboard, we have to to, to find common cause. Uh, we have to dilute some of our more uh, fervid uh, individual causes and uh, and and get along with others. Uh, there are some, uh, there, there are a variety of interesting examples of leadership in the world. Uh, I am fascinated by what uh, President Macron is doing. Uh, he is not a conciliator. I don't, he is in many ways a conciliator, uh, but uh, it's, um, uh, he's, a, he's a bigger risk taker than he is a conciliator. And what's interesting is that he combines, uh, combines those talents. Uh, there is a lot of conciliating capacity uh, in, um, in the modern world. And um, uh, sometimes it gets quite frustrated because conciliation means you rarely get your own way. Uh, you get part of what you want, but, uh, but so do others. And I, I think that uh, these, these questions as to uh, uh, A, what wasn't work, what, what isn't working uh, that, we, that used to work, B, uh, what capacities we have as individuals or as countries uh, that can work better and see how we mobilize that, how we make that work in very particular uh, instances. And I, I, I'm not suggesting I'm inventing this. I, this is happening in a lot of cases. I, I have the opportunity to observe some of it and, uh, and see it happening and see some of the, the methods uh, that arise that work. I want to come back to uh, what happened in 1983 when you lost the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party, but you chose to run again as a member of parliament and you became a senior cabinet minister, uh, the, what would now be called the foreign affairs minister in, in Brian Mulroney's cabinet, um, which is, uh, was a rare thing in, in Canadian politics for a leadership candidate and a former leader to serve in, in someone else's cabinet. And I think it would be an even more unusual thing today. As, as you and I speak today, uh, in the days before the inauguration of a new president in the United States, um, let's just say that it, the, the defeat is not being accepted graciously in that, uh, in that situation, certainly the opposite. Um, so tell me more about that decision you made, what was at the heart of it, and, and what you learned from that. Well, let me say two things. First of all, Trump is an exception. Uh, our worry should not be that another Trump arise, or will arise. That might happen. Our worry has to be that a lot of Americans who had uh, uh, been raised in a more or less consensual way uh, have been profoundly changed, and it will be a change that will last a long time. In part, it's because they were genuinely, genuinely excluded, and they naturally resented that. But what is worse is that a leader used his power to divide what he should be uniting. And uh, I think um, we'll see what happens. But uh, uh, I would hope what, what that will mean is that the, the attitude that the United States took towards its friends has been brutally bruised by the... Um, 
the Trump era. And we should not assume that it will be easy uh, to come back simply because the new the, the president-elect wants to do that. He's dealing with a population that has been made more hostile towards others. Uh, and uh, that, that has, to be, uh, has to be dealt with. Back to 83. Um, I believed, I, I convened a convention because I felt I had a duty to help my party win an election. Uh, and I was having difficulty doing that with what appeared to be the divides in the party at that time. And uh, I felt an obligation uh, as the person who had come second uh, to uh, do what I could to bring people uh, back together. I think the phrase we used was, those who have called for unity now have to practice it. Uh, but, but I also am interested in public life. Uh, I, uh, and I, I was immodest enough to believe that I could continue to make a contribution to it. Uh, and um, uh, to his great credit, uh, Brian Mulroney, partly realizing that he needed me, uh, but all just needed me in terms of the dyna dynamics of the party going forward, but also, I think, recognizing that the country is too big for one person leadership uh, uh, invited me to a very senior responsibility and gave me a substantial amount of authority while I was, uh, uh, while I was there. So I had the opportunity to continue to serve. I had the opportunity to apply some of the things that I had learned uh, and some of the things I knew as a Western Canadian in, uh, in national affairs. To, uh, to a new government. And uh, he was, uh, was wise enough and open enough to, uh, to accept that despite some fairly insistent opposition from some of the people who were close to him. Uh, but he did that. And it's, um, ours is an example that uh, should be much more widespread. And you're right, it hasn't been. Uh, and our relationship, while it had its difficult moments, was by and large much more collegial uh, than um, uh, than the relationship of other past competitors has been one with the other. Yeah, there are certainly yes, many sir. examples uh, of the opposite of leadership rivals who don't work well together in the in the yeah. period that follows. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the approach that you brought to politics and to leadership because uh, it is it strikes me that there is. Uh, first of all, an authenticity to you that there are a lot of politicians who kind of have facades and have, you know, sort of uh, are projecting an image that they think the, 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 the public wants to see from them. I don't see that from you. Um, I do think you were someone who was focused on consensus, who was focused on the bigger picture. I think that is a rare quality, unfortunately, in politics. You, you seem to have avoided some of the bitterness that that arises in politics uh, so often, um, and and I think because of that, despite the fact that you didn't rattle off a string of election victories, you when you left politics, you were described as one of the most respected politicians of your time. Um, so, what do you think some of the lessons are in that? Do we not uh, do we not need more of that in in leadership today? We do need more. We do need more, more of that, obviously. And um, uh, some of the modern trends make that more difficult. The assertion of interest groups, the deterioration of the the uh, reconciling role of national political parties, uh, all of those things are uh, are factors here. But there are a lot of people in public life who, if they were allowed to be themselves, and I had the privilege, both as prime minister. Uh, making my own mistakes, but making my own mark. And then as a senior minister and active in public affairs, I was able to follow many of my, uh, my own instincts. Uh, and uh, I think that that, um, uh, that recognition that uh, any group, but certainly political parties, has multiple instincts, that need, uh, multiple talents that have to be developed, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's important. I want to go back, if I can, to the, um, because I've been reflecting on this, I want to go back to the question of changing things that were in practice, uh, because we did quite a bit of that. Um, one of the classic examples was in the free trade agreement. The practice in free trade agreement was to keep the provinces at a distance, and uh, that was what 
we planned to do when we began, and that was certainly the instinct of a lot of our, our principal advisors. We came to the recognition that uh, that wasn't going to work. Uh, first of all, the provinces had very different views, some of them very strong views. And so we brought them directly into the process. And there's a lot of worry about that because that's not the way that federal provincial relations are supposed to work. And yet that partnership that uh, uh, Prime Minister Mulroney and I uh, and other of our colleagues uh, drove and, and, and uh, advocated made a big difference in, in getting the agreements that we, uh, uh, that we got. I brought that also to my responsibilities in constitutional affairs uh, because for most people, for most of the commentators, the quote unity issue in Canada was a French English issue. And that is undoubtedly a fundamentally important part of this, but it's become, but the Meech Lake Accord uh, failed in part because people who thought that their interests were equally important, not as important perhaps, but certainly important, uh, found no place for themselves in that agreement, which had deliberately and productively been narrowly focused. So I was determined to broaden the focus. And there's a lively debate among people who worked with me and worked against me that I broadened it too much. Uh, I think I didn't. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the quite interesting things about um, that Charlottetown process uh, there were two elements that were critically important. One is that the Indigenous people were present at the table. Uh, four major groups, the four major groups were there. They were there as though they were provinces, except they didn't have a vote, but they were present in every single discussion. And uh, their, uh, their influence was, uh, uh, was substantial. And that was, uh, uh, that was one uh, critical distinction uh, of, that, uh, of that factor. And the other was that because we were all in the room together, we came to a unanimous agreement on a very wide range of proposals. I won't argue, I didn't then, that each one of them, those was ideal, but each one of those broke open possibilities for real change. And what was extraordinary was that uh, everyone agreed, all of the provinces, all the territories, the indigenous people. Uh, Charlottetown bears the burden of being seen in terms of the referendum where it was rejected for reasons I understand. But what was at least as important, probably more important, was that when there was a real effort to draw, to draw people together and to treat the issues that were of concern to them as being equal to the issues that were of concern to others, we were able to get a, uh, a consensus and a consensus, a unanimous agreement as to yeah. how we would, uh, would proceed. I think that um, the, we all bear terrible bruises from the referendum. And I think that the, the bruises of the referendum have caused us to underestimate uh, both the reality and the method by which we achieve that kind of, uh, uh, of consensus at the time. Uh, I think that needs uh, much more examination in terms of our, our, way, uh, our way forward. Yeah, and and, uh, and to underscore the point that you've just made, while the Charlottetown Accord was defeated in a national referendum of Canadians, that it, it is uh, still uh, a historic agreement in the sense that it, it uh, gained the, the unanimous support of all of the provinces and the Indigenous groups that you mentioned. Uh, so to emerge from that kind of gathering with unanimous support was a historic achievement, even though it didn't clear the next hurdle. The question so, now is what might we learn from that? And that's, yeah. uh, that's not for this conversation, but I think that uh, uh, there is a, a requirement to go back and figure out uh, some of the things that we, uh, uh, that we learned. I mean, Charlottetown was, um, uh, we had some quite fierce disagreements. I used to run those meetings by adjournment. Uh, and uh, I remember at one point uh, when we were, when the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador was digging in on something and we were getting nowhere, the Premier of Alberta, the late Don Getty, came to me and said, might be time for another adjournment. And uh, Don Getty went down and spoke to Clyde Wells and he came back to me 40 minutes later and he said, if we tried this, this might work. 
And uh, I spoke to Ovi Nekridi, the indigenous leader, and said, uh, would this work? And he called all of his, he was not only at the table, he had uh, his 12 national chiefs in the room. He called them off. They came back and they said, that wouldn't, but this would. And uh, long story short, we got an agreement on that. So a principal architect of this was Don Getty, uh, who was not generally recognized as being one of the driving forces in, uh, in Charlotte. But, but what happens when you have people not only together in a room, but vested together in an enterprise, is that uh, they are prepared to apply their, uh, their own talents. I don't want in any of this to suggest that, uh, uh, to deny the imperfections in Charlottetown. It's full of imperfections, full of things that would have to be uh, amended and massaged and changed as we, as we went forward. Uh, but the process of getting that far uh, is, uh, is really important because it was cooperative, because it was Canada at its federal best. Uh, and, uh, uh, and among other things, uh, I have to be careful how I say this, but um, part of what made this work is that the indigenous leaders moved away from some of their firmest positions too. Uh, it wasn't all to them. It was from them as well as to them, as it was uh, for all the rest of us. And uh, that is what a federation is about. And uh, that is what problem solving is about, particularly when the problems uh, are, uh, uh, the re one of the reasons medical uh, practitioners are so widely respected is that uh, their knowledge is relatively precise. I'm not minimizing the complexity of developing or applying vaccines, but it's relatively precise. Negotiation is a much more broadcast uh, kind of, uh, uh, of arrangement. And uh, we, um, we have to, in a sense, we have to draw people beyond their precisions uh, to uh, take a look at uh, at, uh, at, the, at the wider interest and how we might accomplish most of that together. Yeah, and, I, and I wanted to ask you about some of the lessons that you learned from that, uh, in not so much in the context of, of politics or, or constitutional affairs, but more just the, the human dynamics around negotiating and building consensus and, and give and take and that sort of thing. I think we always have to remember where the other side is coming from. Um, this is not a, a major factor, but um, uh, it's interesting to me that I am the only Canadian prime minister born and raised in the three prairie provinces. Uh, John Diefenbaker went to Saskatchewan as a nine or 10 year old, and he was unquestionably an icon of the prairies. Uh, but um, we all grow up somewhere. Uh, we all are shaped by what we see. One of the things you grew up with in Alberta uh, is um, a sense that we're just a little outside the center, sometimes more than a little, uh, and that uh, it keeps showing up in unexpected ways. It shows up in where you go to school. It shows up in how you meet. It shows up in how long, in it, before airplanes were commonly used, how long it took a business uh, to get to talk to a deputy minister, all those kinds of things. And so there is a sense of being a little bit on the outside in, uh, in Western Canada. Uh, it's not, uh, Alberta is as much distant as it is petroleum. And uh, that has to be borne in mind it, it, when one, uh, uh, and in the, in the question of, of, uh, of Quebec, in the, the traditional basic Canadian question, uh, it's not just a question of language. It's much more a question of culture. There has to be a sense of recognition of the legitimacy of, uh, of, the, of the, the French Canadian uh, culture in the country. And, uh, it's, uh, and what it means to individuals, what it means to the country. So we have to put ourselves inside the thinking of people on the other side of the table. A lot of us do that in life, uh, but uh, we, we don't do it as well in public policy terms. And uh, I think that this is a time when, one, we have recognized that a lot of the assumptions that have guided us don't work, uh, need re-examination, and secondly, we have our own examples, we Canadians do, as to how we can find uh, some common cause. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. I don't think we do enough of it in life, frankly, of of putting ourselves no, in don't. the other person's shoes and and really trying to understand where they're coming from. Um, and and I worry that uh, things like social media um, and and even the amount of time we've spent apart in the last year, because I think proximity matters in some of these things. Like I think, for example, it's a, it's a lot easier to think that. Uh, the driver of another car on the road is a jerk than it is to think a pedestrian who's walking past you is a jerk because you're there's there's proximity there that makes you more understanding and more likely to connect with them as a human being yeah yeah we we are losing pro- i mean one of our one of the casualties is proximity and um and even <laughs> when we meet on our little walks in our circumscribed neighborhoods, we are precisely careful to keep our distance. And uh, that's, um, that we have to do that, but it, you're right. There is a, uh, uh, there is a price to all of this, but it's also principally an attitude of mind. Uh, we, um, we have to learn to look beyond ourselves and uh, that's uh, always a challenge. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, and even another example, I, I remember a few years ago getting on a bus and and at, at the early stages of smartphones and getting on a bus and seeing how everybody on the bus was, as I walked down the aisle, was staring at their phone, uh, where maybe in another time, they would have been more likely to end up having some kind of conversation with the stranger sitting next to them. Yeah, uh, that's a yeah. casualty. I don't want to make it sound like it's all bad, but these are just some of the things that I think we need to overcome. Well, and you know, it's interesting. Um, my two grandchildren are learning remotely now. Uh, uh, Charlie will go back he's younger. He'll go back a little earlier than Alexandra, and uh, they're both. Uh, they both have friends when the friends are close to them, are proximate. Uh, but um, they're being raised in an atmosphere that is unlike uh, what I felt when I was 11 or 14. Uh, and, um, uh, and being able to communicate with the world electronically doesn't make a difference. Uh, what I learned that mattered really was much more personal, casual, almost accidental, the sort of thing that happened. So those are, are that's an important uh, factor for us to, uh, to bear in mind. But I come back to the, what we really need to do is open our eyes to what isn't working uh, and to be determined to try to do something about it. And uh, that's not simply a question of where we house our seniors. Uh, that's a much broader question that uh, requires more examination than we thought we had. Who would have thought just to go back to the dramatic U.S. example, who would have thought that that highly successful system, with all of its faults, would have broken down uh, so quickly uh, in the Trump as it did in the uh, in the Trump era? Uh, again, I was speaking to a friend of mine who has been um, involved in American public life for decades, uh, and I asked him about a, a particularly cantankerous Republican senator of. 60 years ago, uh, whom he'd known and worked with. And he said uh, he was always ferocious until the last five minutes. And then he'd find a deal. And uh, you could say that's not the way systems are supposed to work, but it's the way that it did work. And for a long time, that worked uh, very successfully in the United States. Uh, and now it has, now it's been broken, which is to say that some of our best habits are frail. And they're frail in part because um, without noticing we're drifting away from them, we're drifting away from them. And we're not really uh, uh, putting anything new in their place. Yeah, and, and when you say we need to open our eyes to what isn't working, I think that that is one of the defining elements of leadership. And I, I think there is a reluctance sometimes, uh, not just in politics, but in business leadership and in leadership and other forms to to focus, uh, to, to not sort of confront the brutal facts of what isn't working and, and, and deal with it, and instead focus attention on the things that are working and sort of ignore those other things and hope they'll take care of themselves or, or even be defensive about them. 
uh, because you're being attacked and criticized over the things that aren't working. Yeah. Well, listen, this has been a real pleasure and a real treat for me. And, and I'm so grateful for your time and, and the wisdom that you've shared and, and the, the stories that you've told. And, and very grateful for your long career of service to our country and to the world. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. It really was an honor to speak with Joe Clark on Digging Deep. And I want to thank his daughter, Catherine, for helping me make that happen. I'm really struck by Joe Clark's authenticity, his willingness to listen, his willingness to learn, collaborate, contribute throughout his career. And I think there were a lot of powerful lessons there for any leader. But of course, there is much that we can take from this to apply to the current state of politics in the world. So once again, a huge thank you to Joe Clark for joining us on Digging Deep. And if you enjoyed this episode, please review it and share it with others. That will help us produce more great episodes and reach more people. And if you want to keep digging deep into topics and lessons like this, or see the show notes, or subscribe to our weekly newsletter, or read my blog, you can do all of that at letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you.